Hub Lectures. This is advanced Bible study in which we interact with the scriptures to arrive at a fully biblical worldview. The title of this series is Divine Human Rebellions. I'd like you to take a look at my website, colandi.com, and there you'll find out about the prophetic and apostolic teaching, equipping, and training ministry to the nations. You will also be able to access all the Hub material together with the videos in playlist form and PDFs of the lecture notes. The lecture notes are much fuller than what I can cover in the actual lectures, but also there are footnotes and references, so make sure you check it out. This lecture is, of course, free, but if you follow the QR code on the screen, you'll be able to make a donation to this teaching ministry to ensure that more and more videos can be made and distributed. I want you to send in your questions and you can do that in the comment section below or you can go to my website and there you will be able to get an email address to contact me directly. I'll try and get to as many questions as I can but don't forget some of your questions are likely to be answered in subsequent sessions. If you enjoy this video then please share it with others. You can also press like, subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you won't miss any future videos. Hello and welcome to this final lecture in the series, Divine Human Rebellions. Over the last five lectures, we've been looking at three divine human rebellions found in the scriptures, in the book of Genesis in particular, Genesis 3, the fall, Genesis 6, the episode with the sons of God and the daughters of man and the Nephilim, And then Genesis 11, the Babel story. This time, we're looking at Deuteronomy 32, still continuing with the Babel story, but looking at what Deuteronomy actually makes of it. And we learn so much, and it's very, very significant to the whole of our understanding of Bible theology, Bible history, eschatology, uh, salvation, the covenants, everything is tied up with this. So Deuteronomy 32 presents a kind of worldview. Um, you, you'll see when we go through this how how far-reaching it is in, in terms of if its significance. So to call it a worldview, a, a bit of an exaggeration, I guess, but it's certainly a perspective that we have to grasp if we're going to understand so much about the Bible, so much about the history of Israel, the history of the nations, the coming of Messiah, the the Davidic kingdom, um, and also even the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, in which the curse of Babel, the confusion of languages, was reversed. So much here for us to think about. So let's get down to it. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 32 picks up the Babel story, but then adds some, gives us insight into what was taking place in the spiritual realm during that Babel rebellion. Uh, verses 8 and 9 in Deuteronomy 32 tell us, give us, gives us an understanding of what was happening in the spiritual realm. Verses 8 and 9, Deuteronomy 32 says, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind. He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted heritage. So I've given you there um, on the screen some of the words used for the names of God. When the Most High, Elion, gave to the nations their inheritance, he divided uh, mankind, that's Bene Adam, and fix the borders of the people, peoples according to the number of the sons of God, Bene Elohim, but the Lord's portion 
Yahweh's portion is his people. Let's stick with the divine names here just to begin with. When the Most High, Elion, which comes from two, two words, Al and Yon, one is uh, meaning high and uh, height, high, and the other is a superlative, highest. So God Most High is the most, is the highest God, uh, not just the highest in a series, but he is the most high God, meaning not just the head of a pantheon, because the Hebrew Bible does not teach that Yahweh has a pantheon. He is the only God, the only eternal, uncreated God. He is Ha Elohim, Ha Elohim, the only uncreated Elohim. But he also created other Elohim, spiritual beings, who are not just subordinate to him, but infinitely subordinate to him. Because uh, the Most High God is the only uncreated God. Now, because he's the Most High God, he is over all things, over all nations, over all situations, over all circumstances. Nothing has come into being other than he initiated it, brought it into being. And even when rebellions take place, and therefore God's judgments begin to be outpoured and evident in the earth, the Most High God remains in control, in control over all things. Now, I want you to notice that Elion, the Most High, this is the name when God speaks to about the nations. He is over all nations. And uh, then we, obviously, it's going back to Genesis chapter 11, when it says he divided mankind and fixed the borders of the peoples. When did this happen? When did he divide mankind? humankind, Bene Adam, the sons of Adam. When did he divide them? When did he fix the borders? Why? That's back in Genesis 11. So Deuteronomy 32 is definitely talking about the Babel story. And then it goes on to say he divided these uh, borders according to the, fixed the borders according to the number of the sons of God, Bene Elohim, Bene Adam, Bene Elohim. So there's a, a, a good symmetry in, in the Hebrew. We're going to come uh, in a moment to talk about the textual difference here, the textual question, but let's go on for now. And then notice the Lord's name here is Yahweh, but the Lord's, that's Yahweh's portion, is his people. Yahweh is not just the name given to the God who is most high over all. Yes, he is. But it, this name, Yahweh, has a specific context. It has a special significance. This is God's covenant name. And when would you expect God to use his covenant name? Why? When he's talking about his covenant people. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, his allotted heritage. So these two verses tell us a lot. Tell us that at Babel, God confused the languages of the people. He scattered the nations and set borders and territories for them, put, putting them under the dominion, under the government, under the, the uh, stewardship of the sons of God. Um, and, but the, he, he uses the name here, Elion, God most high, the one over the nations. Now he uses his covenant name because he's speaking about his covenant people. So this tells us that God separated himself from the nations, handed them over to the sons of God, spiritual beings, um, and g giving them territorial responsibility and to take care of the gov their government, government uh, in insofar as the heavens govern the earth anyway. Um, but he started again with a new nation, a covenant people, and he revealed himself as Yahweh to this new nation. This is his covenant name. And so the story of Babel is more than some kind of a humanistic episode in which uh, humanity decides in some way to uh, move away from God and, and build their own building and do their own thing. This is far deeper than that. Let's come now to the issue of the textual variant. You will notice that some 
of the Bibles have sons of Israel and not sons of God. And this is because there is such a thing as textual variants. What are textual variants? Well, the manuscripts of the Bible were originally written on materials such as papyrus and then also leather and so on. Um, and none of those of those manuscripts survive from the, the, the very first time that they were written. But we have a really good record of what was written because these manuscripts were copied and copied and quoted and recopied and passed down the generations. Now, inevitably, when manuscripts have this kind of manual transmission, um, when they are written out and copied by hand and passed on to the next generation, there will be discrepancies, there'll be mistakes, there'll be errors, there'll be spelling errors, words will be missed out. That doesn't leave us with despair because there are so many of these copies that it's very easy to reconstruct, well, I would say very easy, certainly very possible to construct as near as, 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 as it makes any difference at all to the original. So in Deuteronomy 32 verses eight and nine, there is a textual variant. Um, and we're looking at three major texts uh, right now. There's the Masoretic text, which has sons of Israel, Bene Yisrael. That's what it what appears in the Hebrew version of the of the uh, Masoretic text. Now the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the Hebrew version that is preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls in that library in Qumran has sons of God, Bene Elohim. So you have the Masoretic text, sons of Israel, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, sons of God. Interesting, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, has the Greek word angeloi, angels, angels of God, meaning that the Septuagint translators believed that this, these were divine beings. So let's uh, expand on that a little bit. Maybe you haven't got um, um, uh, much um, experience of looking at Masoretic texts, Dead Sea Scrolls and, and Septuagint and so on. OK, but let me help you. You'll find this in footnotes in my PDF notes that you can download from my website. So what is the Masoretic text? It is um, the traditional Hebrew text of the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, and it dates from between the 6th to the 10th centuries in the Christian era or the common era. So that is 6 to 10 centuries after Christ. It's quite a late text, but it's very reliable, very meticulously um, produced, and it has diacritical markings on it. The original Hebrew text of the Bible was just capital and consonants only, and the way that the words were pronounced, the vowels were supplied through oral tradition. And then finally, everything's written down so that we have the Hebrew text of the Bible today where we can read it and know which vowels go between which, which consonants. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, this actually has the oldest Hebrew text of this passage. So it has, carries a lot of authority. It's the oldest Hebrew text. Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the Qumran Caves, which is on the northern shore of the Dead Sea, between 1946 and 1956. A shepherd boy discovered them, and it was a huge discovery. Um, and scholars have been, it's just an absolute goldmine for scholarship. And they discovered there that there was a sect, which some people call the Essenes, the Qumran sect. Scholars have been debating that and there are different views of it. But certainly it was a sect, a slightly separatist sect that had their own uh, expectations of kingdom. But they had their own writings, kept many of their own writings, and those writings are preserved. But as well as that, they were totally, totally committed to the Hebrew Bible. And they have some of the most precious manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible. Now, this passage in 
the Hebrew Bible text that is preserved in, in Qumran, in the Qumran scrolls, not talking about their own um, sectarian writings, but the actual Hebrew scriptures copies that they had. This gives us the reading sons of God. And what is the Septuagint? That is the Bible of the early church. It's the Hebrew Bible translated into Greek. And they tell us that this was translated by Jews living in Egypt between the third and the second centuries before Christ, before the Christian era, before the common era. And this was the Bible of the early church. So when we go to the textual variants, notice that the Dead Sea Scrolls holds the oldest Hebrew manuscript. The, the Masoretic text has sons of Israel. That cannot be correct. Uh, forget whatever textual evidence there is there. And the stronger evidence is for the Dead Sea Scrolls reading. But it simply cannot be sons of Israel because Israel did not exist at the time of Babel. You remember in the last session, I spoke about the table of nations in uh, Genesis chapter 10. Israel is not mentioned there. By the time of Babel, there is no Israel. So this could not be a reference to the sons of Israel. It doesn't make sense. And so we are clear to, I think, very clear and, and many, many scholars these days and textual critics go with the Dead Sea Scrolls reading. So God uh, divided them and allotted them according to the number of the sons of God. We have the flood. God destroys humanity, starts again with Noah and his family. And some generations go by and we find now humanity rebelling again. And it's not as if, I think this is exactly what happened, but when I say it's as if God thought, because I'm not able to read God's mind, but from what I can see from Deuteronomy 32, God looked at this tower at Babel and says, I'm going to have to begin again. He chose not to destroy humanity, but he did choose to begin again. Now, he is the God most high. He is Elion. He's not just going to abandon the nations altogether, but he is going to hand them over to other spiritual powers, the sons of God, the Bene Elohim, and give them a responsibility in trusting the care, the government, the nurture, the development of those nations to the spiritual government of the sons of God. Insofar anyway, as these spiritual rulers actually influence what's happening on earth, they don't intervene and actually uh, uh, do it directly as if as earth leaders do, but they are there to watch over, to help, to assist and to encourage and to nurture and support and to ensure that justice is done, to ensure that society is functioning healthily. But God says, I now am going to begin again. I'm going to choose another nation and build another nation. And this nation will be my nation. I will be their God. I will not be the God of the nations, not in the way that I will be the God of Israel. I'll reveal to them my covenant. I'll reveal my name. I'll reveal my law. I'll reveal my promises. And I will build this nation so that this nation may, may be a light to the nations. And ultimately, from that nation will come the Messiah, who, who will redeem not just Israel, but the nations as well. The Faith Life Study Bible says of this point, the Babel event marks Yahweh disowning the nations of the world as his human family in favor of electing Israel, whom he will also use to reclaim the nations as his people. Let's look at the key points so far. 
The nations have been allotted territorial boundaries with their own language, with their own developing cultures. The nations have been placed under the government of the sons of God. But we go on to discover that the sons of God rebel against Yahweh. They do not govern the way God wanted them to govern. They begin to govern unjustly. And indeed, they begin to govern for themselves and to attract worship to themselves. And this is how the gods of the nations begin to develop and how the false religions and pagan religions, all the different religions of the world grow out of this divine rebellion. Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 and 9 give us the basic story. And then in the verses that follow, we read what happens next. It's written in Deuteronomy as a retrospective, but let us read it as a perspective. In other words, after the scattering, what happened? Deuteronomy 32 verse 12. The Lord Yahweh alone guided him. That's Israel. Him. No foreign God was with him, but Jeshurun, that's another word for Israel, grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, stout and sleek. Then he forsook God, Eloah, another name for God, who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. So the people of God turned away from God and began to worship strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, Shedim, that were no gods, Lo Eloha, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the god, El, who gave you birth. So the people of God turned away from God and began to worship other gods. Who are these gods? They're called Shedim, which is translated demon. Shedim was a word used of territorial spiritual authorities. And of course, when territorial spiritual authorities rebel against God and attract worship to themselves, that becomes demonic. And this is picked up in the New Testament, that the gods of the nations, though they served these nations with idols, the idols themselves were nothing. Nevertheless, behind those idols lay spiritual powers, evil spiritual powers, demons. And the gods of the nations are real. They are the spiritual beings that God created, the Bene Elohim, who rebelled against God and therefore became rebellious and, and, and fallen, fallen sons of God. And so wickedness comes in and God is very distressed by all of this. So Israel begins to worship these rebellious sons of God. They're called demons, Shadim. Um, Israel will be judged. We know from the rest of the story, Israel will be judged, um, but also so will the gods of the nations be judged. We read about that in Psalm 82. But ultimately and finally, Eden is restored and extended to the whole earth. The nations are going to be reclaimed again. This introduces for us the theme of cosmic geography. What is cosmic geography? It's the belief that certain geographical locations were under the dominion of specific divine beings. We find that in the that de, that description in the lexicon glossary of theology. So that's what cosmic geography means. Uh, another more modern term for this is is territorial spirits. In other words, we have geographical areas of the world which are under the spiritual government of of spiritual powers. And this in Deuteronomy 32 is the background to the New Testament teaching of principalities and powers, the spiritual rulers over geographical areas on the earth. And as I say, this is the basis of what scholars call cosmic geography. Now, we have examples of this 
not just here in uh, Deuteronomy 32. We have answer, uh, examples of this in the book of Daniel, where specific princes and spiritual beings are shown to have some kind of governmental authority and influence over geographical areas of the world and whole um, dynasties as well as whole empires. For example, in Daniel 10, 13, we have the story of a, of a revelation that uh, Daniel has seen and there is a, a, a holy visitation and he has been praying for revelation to understand the visions God has given him concerning the end times. And this uh, revelation explains that there's been some spiritual warfare going on. There's been some spiritual battle happening as Daniel has been praying. Spiritual powers have been warring in the heavenlies. And Daniel 10 verse 13 says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of your chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. I don't have time to go into the details of exactly what this battle was about and, and what was the result. I'm simply referring you to Daniel 10 to show you that it's not just in Deuteronomy or indeed the New Testament teaching in Ephesians 6 about principalities and powers doesn't have a shaky foundation, has a very solid foundation in the Old Testament, also developed in, in the intertestamental period in Second Temple Judaism, there's a very strong uh, theological uh, train, a theological train of thought developing from the Old Testament right up until the New Testament. So there are spiritual powers who are opposed to God, who, who interfere with God's plan. And that's a form of spiritual warfare. And Daniel, as he was praying, uh, was, was somehow, he wasn't conscious that the warfare was going on, but he was affected by it because there seemed to be a delay in his in the revelation getting through to him. And then also further on in Daniel 10 verses 20 to 21. Then he said, do you know why I've come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. Uh, but I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these, except Michael, your prince. So we have three princes. We have Michael, who is well, the good guy, one of the good guys. He He's remained loyal to God, and he is the prince that fights for Israel. Then we have the prince of Persia, the rebellious principalities, who now are evil and are opposing the purposes of God. But this theme of cosmic geography is taken a little further in a way that I wonder if you've ever wondered about this strange story. It's taken in the story of Naaman, who is the uh, uh, the, the commander of the army of the king of Syria in Second Kings. And it has to do with cosmic geography, even reaching to the very dirt on the ground of Israel. And so if you remember the story, let, let me recap for you. Naaman is a leper and uh, he hears that there is a prophet in Israel who can cure his leprosy. So Naaman comes with a great deal of pomp and ceremony and presents himself before Elisha the prophet. But Elisha doesn't see him, doesn't even go out to speak to him, just sends a message, go and bathe in the rivers of the Jordan, and you will be cleansed. Naaman's offended. He doesn't like this. How dare this prophet not even speak to me? There are better waters in, in my own country. Uh, why do I have to bathe in the dirty waters of the Jordan? Anyway, somebody talks sense to him and says, what have you got to lose? Go and do it. And you know the story. He dipped himself seven times in the rivers of, of the Jordan. He came up completely clean the seventh time. And so he goes back to Elisha and said, I'm going to reward you, give you tremendous uh, fee for you're a great prophet. And Elisha says, I don't want your money. 
don't want your money, don't, don't know. Um, and so then Naaman has a very peculiar second request. Then let me load up two mules full of dirt from the land of Israel. Why? Let's read about it. Second Kings 5.17. Then Naaman said, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of dirt of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offerings or sacrifices to any God but the Lord. Can you see what's happening here? Don't forget, in those days, everybody understood this cosmic geography. Everybody understood that territory was owned and inhabited by God's spiritual powers. And Israel was the land of the Lord. It was the Holy Land where God manifested his name, where God dwelt, particularly in Jerusalem and, of course, in the temple. That doesn't mean to say that God was not present everywhere else, but he had handed the nations over to these other gods and they had a jurisdiction that had a kind of territorial authority and a territorial responsibility. That's why when the exiles were in Babylon, they said, how can we sing the Lord's song while we're in a strange land? David, when he was exiled on the run from Saul, King David, before he was king, saying, you know, I, I, I can't worship God. I'm, I've been removed from the place. I've been removed from the presence of God outside the territory of Israel. It was deemed not to be Yahweh's territory, the place where his name dwelt, where he manifested his presence. Of course, God is everywhere all the time. But now Naaman says, when I go back, I am not going to worship any other God but, but Yahweh. But how can I worship the God of Israel, the God who, whose territory is here in the land of Israel? How can I worship him when I'm back in Syria? I know. I'll take some dirt. And I don't know what he was going to do. I guess he was going to sprinkle it on the, on, on the ground. And then he was going to stand on that ground and, and, and recall the God of Israel and say, well, I'm standing on the territory of the God of Israel. Now, of course, in New, New Covenant understanding, there is no specific place, town, city, temple, church or geographical area where God specifically dwells. He's out of there. We, we don't have a temple any longer such as the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, we are the temples of the Lord. The church, the body of Christ is the temple. Corporately and individually, he dwells with us. So we are in his presence at all times. But back in that day, this is all they knew. But I tell you that story to show you how far this cosmic geography extends in the understanding of Old Testament theology and indeed how it is embedded in the culture of the day. Not just a cultural idea that has no theological significance, but real theology being expressed through these examples in the Old Testament. And of course, this brings us to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, where Paul continues this understanding of territorial spirits, of cosmic geography, saying that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, people with bodies, but we wrestle against principalities and powers, the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And these aren't just spiritual forces that somehow float uh, around in some nebulous heavenly realm. These words are also words that speak of principalities. A principality is a territory. I think in my own nation, the United Kingdom, I think of the Principality of Wales. That's what it's called. What does it mean? A principality has a prince. There is a Prince of Wales 
and it, it has a geographical area. So the principalities and powers, spiritual forces of wickedness operate over specific nations and territories. However, the New Testament teaching is that Jesus Christ has destroyed and he has overcome, overpowered and conquered those principalities and powers. That's why the gospel can go out to the nations. And there is coming a time in which the gods of the nations will be judged. Psalm 82 verses 6 to 8 say, I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. This goes right back to the Old Testament passages we've been looking at. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. Yes, you're divine beings, your spiritual beings, but you will die just like men. You will fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. In the next series, we're going to be spending a lot more time in Psalm 82. But for now, let's go back to the story of Babel, the scattering of the nations, God abandoning the nations and choosing a new nation. We come to the call of Abraham. So the abandonment of the nations and God's narrow choice of Israel was, was to bring salvation, not just to Israel, but to the whole earth. So this is the promise that God made. He had a view to the nations when he chose Israel. Genesis 12 verse 3, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The call of Abraham. Well, Abraham, before he became Abraham. Why? What is God doing here? Notice his choice of an elderly couple, <laughs> an old man, 90 years of age, an elderly woman. She's barren past the age of childbearing, says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. In your, in your seed, in you and through your seed, your whole, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. I'm going to make your offspring as numerous and as, multi, uh, as the stars of the heavens and the sand of the shore. And these, this old couple, Sarah, Sarai is barren anyway, and they're both past it. They're both old. God says, the whole world is going to know that Israel only exists by my power. This is my doing. That's why they're an ideal couple. And so today we recognize that everything that has come into the world through Israel as a nation, the covenants, the promises, the patriarchs, the scriptures, the Davidic kingdom, the history, and our Messiah has come as a result of God's choice of Israel with a view to reaching the nations. The nations were handed over according to the number of the sons of God. Abraham is called, and Israel is born and becomes Yahweh's inheritance. The nations will be reclaimed through Abraham's offspring, believing Gentiles will become fellow heirs of salvation along with believing Jews. All Israel will be saved and Eden will be global in the end time at the climax of history. And this for me as a new covenant believer one who has called to the nations is so exciting. And for all of us, we're called to serve God. We're called to spread the message of God's kingdom, which is another way of saying God's Eden message. I am going to rule uh, over you and you're going to enjoy me. I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my child. You're going to be my nation. You're going to be my people. You're going to be my children and I'm going to establish my covenant with you. And, and all of this is 
the fulfillment of God's promises that we read about in Genesis. And this curse at Babel, in which language is confused, nations are scattered, territories are ruled over by rebellious sons of God. Jesus as Messiah came to undo all of that. When Jesus came, he destroyed principalities and powers through his death and his resurrection, and he poured out his spirit to equip and to empower the church to spread, bring the gospel to the nations. And in Acts chapter 2, we have the great reversal of Babel. There, the language problem was solved. No more scattering. In fact, Jewish believers from right across the diaspora were gathered in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. And if you look at all the nations that were represented, you see many, if not nearly all, of the nations that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 in the table of the nations, those that were scattered. Now they're gathered together in Jerusalem and God puts his spirit upon them and they hear the mighty works of God being proclaimed in their own dialects. And whereas in Babel, there's a confusion and a scattering and division, now there is a coming together and God is announcing that from now on, the nations are in the way of salvation to the nations, not just to Israel, but the nations is open. And those Jewish believers who came to faith in Christ on the day of Pentecost went back into the nations of the world, carrying the message of the gospel. And then out of that comes the Gentile mission of the church which is pioneered by Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and then also picked up by the Apostle Paul, who becomes the, the great apostle to the nations. And the Apostle Paul set a, a goal under the call of God, God's mission upon his life, to go to every one of those nations which were represented in the book of Genesis chapter 10, even he desired to go to Tarshish, Spain, the only place that was not mentioned on the day of Pentecost. And then beyond that, we have the time where Babylon will be judged. The whole evil system of evil humanity, rebellious humanity, rebelling against God and linking up with rebellious spiritual powers into this end time manifestation of Babylon and God in sending Christ to come back to this earth will destroy all of that and will bring in the new heavens and the new earth and the Zion and everything that was spoken of about Zion, the city of God, Eden, the garden temple of God will be fulfilled and the glory of the Lord shall fill the earth, new heavens new earth, which will be the home of righteousness. the hub lectures this is advanced bible study in which we interact with the scriptures to arrive at a fully biblical worldview the title of this series is divine human rebellions i'd like you to take a look at my website colandi.com and there you'll find out about the prophetic and apostolic teaching equipping and training ministry to the nations you will also be able to access all the hub material together with the videos in playlist form and PDFs of the lecture notes. The lecture notes are much fuller than what I can cover in the actual lectures, 
but also there are footnotes and references, so make sure you check it out. This lecture is, of course, free, but if you follow the QR code on the screen, you'll be able to make a donation to this teaching ministry to ensure that more and more videos can be made and distributed. I want you to send in your questions, and you can do that in the comment section below, or you can go to my website, and there you will be able to get an email address to contact me directly. I'll try and get to as many questions as I can, but don't forget, some of your questions are likely to be answered in subsequent sessions. If you enjoy this video, then please share it with others. You can also press like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so that you won't miss any future videos.